So it's almost inevitable that eventually you're going to be getting a phone call from the nursing staff about a patient, usually in the middle of the night. The patient is delirious and they can't control the patient and they need you to help. So what are you going to do? Well, first you need to understand what delirium is, what causes it, what are the risk factors associated with it, so that you can appreciate how to prevent it, and then finally how to treat it. And so today we're going to cover the, the topic of delirium. And delirium is a very common condition in the ICU with very severe consequences, and it demands that I organize monitoring and treatment approach. So for many years, it was thought that delirium was more of a condition that happened to elderly patients uh, who were probably actually developing dementia anyways. But in studies and surveys of ICU patients, especially patients who are ventilated, we've discovered that the actual present, uh, prevalence of, of delirium is about 60 to 80 percent of all patients. And this is higher in patients who are ventilated. The problem is you don't often recognize delirium because about half of the patients who have delirium will have a form of delirium called hypoactive delirium. And that's the kind where they just lay down, they, they don't move around a lot, they don't look like they're, they're not causing the nursing staff any trouble, and yet when you really assess their mentation, they are completely out of their gourd. The other half of the population of patients with delirium will have a mixture of hypoactive and fluctuating with a hyperactive delirium, and this is the more common type of delirium or the one that we associate with delirium. The patients are flailing around, fighting against things, trying to pull tubes out. That's the form of delirium that most people pay attention to because that's the one that, is, that uh, jumps right out at you, sometimes literally. One of the challenges in treating delirium is to actually have a consistent diagnosis and having a good definition is a good start. In the past, we've called delirium by many things, including things like ICU psychosis, which isn't very specific. And when you're comparing uh, treatments and, and, uh, in the literature, you're uncertain if you're comparing apples to apples. Fortunately, the DSM has come up with a consistent definition for delirium. They can define delirium as a disturbance in consciousness and cognition that develops over a short period of time and tends to fluctuate over the course of the day. Now, the DSM has four criteria that must be met in order to make the definition of delirium, and the guru is going to spell them out for you now. Disturbance of consciousness with reduced awareness of the environment and impaired ability to focus, sustain, or shift attention. Altered cognition, example, memory impairment, disorientation, or language disturbance, or the development of a perceptual disturbance, for example, delusion, hallucination, or illusion, that is not better accounted for by pre-existing or evolving dementia. Disturbance develops over a short period of time, usually hours to days, and tends to fluctuate during the course of the day. Evidence of an etiologic cause which the DSM-4 uses to classify delirium as delirium due to general medical condition, substance-induced delirium, delirium due to multiple etiologies, or delirium not otherwise specified. Thanks, Guru. Another challenge in delirium has been our inability to identify very clear specific risk factors. In a survey of delirious patients uh, many years ago, up to 11 individual risk factors were identified in patients who were developing delirium. So it's very hard to nail down things that are specifically the cause for this. In general, we can break down delirium into modifiable and not modifiable causes. There are also host factors, factors that are associated specifically to the critical illness, and then uh, environmental or iatrogenic causes uh, can, that can increase the risk of delirium. Modifiable risk factors uh, include things like hearing and vision impairment as a host factor, and critical illness-related factors are things like anemia, acidosis, hypotension, infection, sepsis, a number of metabolic disturbances, and fever can all lead to a, a delirious state. And within the environment, things that are modifiable are things like um, a lack of visitors, sedative and uh, analgesic use, immobility, 
sleep deprivation and the presence of catheters, including bladder catheters, endotracheal tubes, and intravascular catheters. There are some things, though, that are not modifiable risk factors. Things like age, uh, the presence of hypertension, pre-existing cognitive impairment, the withdrawal of alcohol and tobacco can all lead to the, uh, to the development of delirium. Similarly, uh, if a patient presents with a history of depression, they're also at an increased risk of developing delirium. The unmodifiable critical illness-related factors are things like high severity of illness, the presence of respiratory disease, medical illnesses, the presence and need for mechanical ventilation, and even things like the number of infusions that are, uh, are running in the patient at any given time. Within the environment, although considered not modifiable but would be modifiable with a little bit of construction, is the problem of a lack of proper sunlight or daylight uh, coming in through a window that allows patients to orientate themselves into their day-night cycle. As well, placing a patient in isolation because they have a multi-drug resistant organism also places them at increased risk for developing delirium. As with many things in medicine, preventing something is a lot better than trying to cure it. But you can't prevent something unless you know it exists. And so monitoring for the development of delirium is important. There are many different measures and scores to try to quantify delirium, but the one that we use most frequently is the ICDSC, which is the Intensive Care Delirium Scoring Criteria. Now this is an eight-point score with a point given if a patient develops an altered level of consciousness, inattentiveness, disorientation, hallucinations, delusions, or psychosis, psychomotor agitation or re retardation, inappropriate speech or moods, sleep or wake cycle disturbance, and any and presence of symptom fluctuation. The patient will get a, a one point for every one of those items that they have during an assessment. And if they have a score over four, then they're at significant risk for having delirium. There are other scoring systems uh, out there, but the one that we use in our intensive care unit is the ICDSE. There are many things we can do to try to prevent the development of delirium. Primarily trying to reduce risk factors. Things like as simple as making sure that the patient gets adequate sleep and trying to prevent sleep deprivation can go a long ways in preventing uh, delirium. Immobile patients are also patients that are more likely to become delirious. And similarly, if they have a hypoactive delirium, immobility only feeds into their delirium. So getting them up, mobilizing them, turning on the lights are all key things that can help, help prevent and, uh, and mitigate the risk of developing a delirium. Sensory impairments are simple things like giving the patient back their glasses, uh, having their hearing aids back in so that they can hear what's going on and see what's going on will help prevent the development of confusion. And then other things like maintaining nutritional status and dehydration and avoiding dehydration are also critical. Probably the most important thing you can do as a physician, though, is to stop giving medications that are known to cause delirium. And the biggest one that is responsible for developing delirium, especially in elderly patients, is using benzodiazepines. These things are poison to the elderly patients. They make them go nuts. So stop any medications that have an association with the developing delirium, because once somebody gets delirium, it's really hard to get rid of it. Now, while Prevention and identifying risk factors is hard enough for delirium. Treatment is even harder. In the past, we used to think that probably the only thing we could do was just ride out the storm. Eventually, they would get better from their critical illness and their head would clear up eventually. But there are some things we can do, and especially when patients are much more active and hyperactive, you need to intervene to try and prevent them from harming themselves. There are very few medications that are on the market that can treat delirium, and probably your best bet is to first and foremost focus on the physical environment to make sure that everything that you're doing to the patient, such as preventing them from getting adequate sleep and screwing up their day-night cycle, is, is uh, prevented in order to try and reduce their, the amount of delirium that they're going to get. Once delirium gets going, it's hard to get on top of it. Benzodiazepines are frequently uh, d uh, prescribed for patients who are developing delirium. And the problem with that is that they're poisonous. They make the delirium much worse. It's the opposite problem. And I can't begin to describe how frequent I've heard this statement from a nursing staff. Patient was starting to get agitated overnight. We called the resident. The resident gave us a, uh, an order for 
for midazolam or Ativan, and then the patient went even crazier. And so we asked for more. And I'm like, I can't believe you actually put, you can't put those statements together. The benzodiazepines are responsible for worsening delirium, especially in patients who are elderly, and especially when they're giving it at night. Now, that being said, there are no drugs that are specifically approved for delirium, and most of what we give is based on pretty poor data. Probably the, the, the drug of first choice and first and, I guess, highest level of evidence is haldopyranol. Now, this is a dopamine receptor antagonist, which is frequently used in order to control what we call the positive symptoms of delirium, so the, you know, the agitation, the hyperactive component of the delirium. It doesn't really do much for the hypoactive component of the delirium, however, but it does have some minor sedation properties, which may help, especially if the patient is very hyperactive. The usual doses don't have to be that large, and you can start with 2 to 5 milligrams uh, intravenously every 20 minutes uh, as a start and as necessary to see if that helps. Rarely, you're going to need to escalate the dose that you're giving, depending on how aggressive and, and dangerous the patient is being to themselves. There are a variety of other atypical antipsychotics on the market, such as risperidone, quetiapine, and olanzapine, which may be better because they also have other blockade of other neurotransmitters, like norepinephrine and acetylcholine. But there's really no proof that these are better than Haldol. And you really should use what you're familiar with using. You may find that individual attending staff will have their own personal beliefs on what works and what doesn't work, and you can try those, like, those out as well under their guidance. The most important thing when you're giving antipsychotics is to watch the, the uh, QTC to make sure that they don't develop a torsade de point, and also watch for the development of uh, extraparietal uh, side effects. There is a drug that's come onto the market which may be more more helpful for treating delirium, and that's dexamethamidine or Prexidex. And this may be considered in certain cases, but this has to be ordered as directed by your attending physician, and it shouldn't be something that you're doing in the middle of the night. So in the past, we used to think that delirium was a relatively benign condition. Patients would get it, they'd be a little bit nuts in the ICU for a little while, then so storm clouds would settle, and then everything would be fine, the patient would go home. But in fact, one of the more important things we now know about delirium is that it has a significant long-term consequence. The immediate effects are more related to what it does to your length of stay. Having a delirium causes you to have a prolonged ICU stay regardless of your underlying diagnosis. This also results in you having a prolonged hospitalization, increases your risk of being institutionalized after your hospitalization, and because you're in the hospital and in the intensive care unit for a longer period of time, it increases your risk of both uh, mortality and also complications, as you would expect for anything that causes somebody to stay in a hospital longer, increasing their risk. The interesting thing we know about delirium, though, is it not only increases your risk of death while you're in hospital, it increases your risk of death for six months after your hospitalization. And we know this from studies where we followed up on patients who had developed ARDS, and we were following up their primary pulmonary outcomes, but assessed their cognitive status after, uh, after their hospitalization and found that they had significant long-term effects from their, from their delirium, including long-term cognitive impairment, including things like their memory and executive function. And for somebody who's older and vulnerable, that can be a significant problem that can make the difference between going home and going into a nursing home. So this is not something that should be treated benignly. The prognosis when you develop delirium can be quite dire. So that's all there is to it. Now in the past, delirium used to be thought as a relatively benign condition that happened rarely to patients and was more afflicting patients who were already predisposed to developing dementia. We now know that it actually is a very serious condition with serious long-term consequences and occurs very frequently in the intensive care unit. There are a wide variety of risk factors that we know of and many that we haven't actually identified yet. These risk factors are modifiable and some are not modifiable. But regardless, focusing on the risk factors is probably your best way to try to prevent, uh, prevent the development of delirium. Once it starts, we really don't have a lot of good medical options to try and treat it other than reducing their, uh, their risk factors, trying to control their environment better so that they can try and get themselves reorientated, and then trying medications like antipsychotics such as haldopyranol, elancipine, seroquil, or risperidone.
the one drug you absolutely want to avoid is benzodiazepines. This will make the condition worse. Treatment is hard, prevention is hard, and the consequences of delirium are serious. Thank you.